I'm going to take you on a different kind of journey today. It's a journey about design, which is very closely intertwined with my own uh, life through design. And with your permission, I would like to share part of my journey and some anecdotes from my personal experience with uh, design. I've lived through the decades of design as it changed over time. And my theory is that design is changing in the right direction, and we are, but we have to make some tweaks in the process. So I'll take you through several stages of design, how we arrived at where we are, but I will intermingle my personal story with this. I grew up in Kerala, and it's nice to be back in America, in, in India, in Hyderabad. Um, Kerala is known as God's own country. You probably know that. Um, it's a fantastic place, which is very much intertwined with nature. And I love sunsets, as you can see. Um, I grew up in a large family of uh, five brothers and a sister. It was like uh, growing up in the Navy, you know, it was tough in the beginning. But the saving grace was that we all had certain uh, affinity for design, all the brothers and the sister. And our father, who was a police officer, but he was a tinkerer, he had a workshop which he, with all the carpentry machines and everything in it, which he let us use. And we learned the advantage or the, the value of working with your hands early on in our life. And one of the brothers who actually built a whole uh, model, scale model of a township went on to become the chief town planner for the Sultanate of Oman. And another brother is a very practicing architect with a lucrative, what do you call, extensive business in the south of India. And my younger brother, Vijay, became um, the chief of design management at uh, Illinois Institute of Technology, Institute of Design in Chicago. So that's where we ended up. But my own personal um, education in uh, engineering was boring, and I was not very really excited with it. I had a personal political life on the side. Uh, so I was involved with some social grassroots uh, organization, one of them was called the Third Eye Movement. The movement was that it was a horizontal organization, there was no leaders, but we got together every once in a while, addressed a kind of a local problem or something which we are not satisfied with. We tried to kind of deal with it ourselves and create solutions and implemented them. So for example, one of the projects we did was putting uh, directional signs on the Kerala transport buses. So these signs were, they, they never had any fully written, clearly written signage on the boards where the, the people did not know where the buses were going. So we took it on ourselves. We created a series of graphic boards for directions and we kind of stopped the buses in the center of the town and put, put these signs on them. And we got tremendous local support and the next thing you know, the government, uh, the, the transportation department uh, hired a sign painter because they realized that there is a problem with theirs. Another project we wor worked on was um, creating the street uh, uh, traffic signs, so the lines which are required for pedestrian crossings and car, car parking spaces. There was none in the city of Trivandrum at that time. So we kind of went in, bought the paints, you know, it, we were funded by the Archbishop of Trivandrum at that time. We went out in the night and painted the streets with the, with the street signage required for pedestrian crossings and car, car stalls. And to our surprising delight, the next day morning, the police were in, implementing, enforcing these traffic rules in the city. So it was kind of a 
we subconsciously we were using design thinking and change making and we may have invented the first version of the flash mob the internet was just a glint in our eyes at that time but we kind of stumbled upon this idea of social change through uh, reverse influencing the system my own design um, initiation happened through industrial design center in bombay professor sudhakar nadkarni who was uh, founder of industrial design center was uh, my mentor i also got to know professor kumar vyas and uh, professor atwankar and ig rao who are, are still there very much active of course professor vyas died i believe uh, professor nadkarni introduced me to a series of uh, social design opportunities the image which you see on the left there is a mobile shop which i designed which got implemented uh, in the twin city of mumbai mumbai at least for a short time i don't know what happened to it nowadays and the and my own colleagues in the classes were also doing projects which had some kind of social relevance or social change the top right image shows a shoe shine stand which is meant for shoe shine laborers and the one below is a ticket dispenser for the local bus conductor anyway um, in spite of this fact that idc was inspiring for me i wanted to go west you know which is what most of the iitians were doing at that time there was a big brain drain going on in india i ended up going to syracuse university because i met professor arthur pulos and rolf fasti who well, rolf fasti was a pioneer in design thinking he was the person who introduced design thinking at the d school in stanford even the idea is credited with it later on uh he was the person who was driving this initiative in the early stages so he was my mentor and i worked with him on my thesis project i wanted to design cars just like every other 20 something designer every you know all through the ages in until even now but uh, these two professors encouraged me to go into education and i was teaching at university of cincinnati and rhode island school of design for a while so now i'm going to get into the introduction of this my theory this is the timeline which i kind of established but i have a disclaimer here it has i'm not a historian and these numbers are just guesses or guesstimates at this point but these are the stages we went through as, as design as a design profession we kind of are evolving and alvin toffler once said that um, design you know every discipline goes through stages of fusion and fission fusion meaning blending with proximal disciplines and fission is all about um, splintering into sub disciplines within the discipline industrial design is actually going through these phases now but by combining design and business we have kind of created a business design discipline and then within design itself we are splintering into service design interaction design and graph and uh, user interface design maybe but these are all natural evolutions we need to go there now we have come to the social design watershed so to speak so coming back to this diagram it's about the post bahos era lasted until the 80s pretty much and then you know i will go through these stages one by one post post bahos era was all about design for industry as we know focus on materials and processes and uh, all the design schools in the us and europe at least had a common foundation program which came from Uh, from the bahos or the ulm school later on um the focus on materials and processes is important because it's very it was what to start in the foundation courses so i did some experiments towards you know the end of my career at the university of cincinnati and i did this in uh, indian indian institute of design also later on industrial design center 
So this was a, the image which you see is a Boolean intersection of an apple and a pear. So I was trying to introduce the principles of digital image creation to the old foundation program. So this is an experiment. So then we went straight into the digital decade, which is when all the designers and computer graphics experts were involved in integrating 3D modeling into the visualization of form. And I myself did some experiments on electronic mannequin, which actually helped the fashion designers to drape clothes on them. And then some human dynamics about human movement studies done in early 3D modeling packages. Then we transition to the consumer experience era, which is the 2000s. Um, and this time we kind of had this whole concept of design thinking or empathy, um, consumer focus and empathy building tools. So we expanded our circle of influence, the business leaders got interested in it because it was kind of popularized. It was brought to the mainstream through TV and media publications. IDEO was a big proponent of design thinking and the corporations benefited from it. We were able to create um, objects and products which are responding to the consumer user experience. The image which you see there is a washing machine we built in um, Whirlpool for the Asian market um, called 123 machine and 123 is easy to use for um, in the Asian uh, market we, we know that the people who use the machines are actually the household help and not necessarily the, the owner of the, of the machine itself. So this kind of simplifying the interfaces coming from empathy and design thinking and we also developed the experience design language at Whirlpool. We don't call it visual brand language anymore. We kind of created this experience built into our products uh, during my time at Whirlpool. So we got, got some pretty good results from it. There was another product which is built um, a twin tub washing machine, once again for the Asian market, which won the Edison Award because of the consumer for insights which we turned into uh, features of like the wheels and a scrubbing board and, uh, and the lid which you can use as a carrying uh, bucket for uh, clothes. The image which you see on the right um, is, the, is a concept car we built for demonstrating how the future of food is changing and entertainment is changing. So this was done during the time when I was head of the advanced design program uh, and I built the studio in Chicago to really look at what's happening in the future. And then came the ecocentric era. The corporations were also interested in how we can be more environmentally conscious, um, maybe driven by CSR and other kind of regulations in the system. Uh, this was a project, once again, I want to share this with you. We, we designed this in the 2015-16 timeframe. They're just coming into the market. It's a composter where you can actually, you know, use the food waste and turn it into compost within 24-hour timeframe. We worked with PNG on developing this, this design. Now the last uh, phase that where we are in is the design for social change. And that's where, you know, UNSDG and WDO has a tremendous influence on how we are going to tackle this area. Um, this is a you know, frame from my students' work where they are actually dealing with the complexities of the system. You know, dealing with food is not just about buying food in the marketplace, but how, you, where it comes from and the farmer's economy and the distribution system as well as how the waste is handled within the system. I myself had a prior experience with this inability to implement systems in the, mar in the, in the context. This is a, a new stand design which I, uh, my team worked on for the city of New York. We kind of created this whole model 
but we could not implement it because there was no infrastructure system to sort of support us in making this happen within the city orthodoxies which exist. So my theory once again is that we need to get involved in the policy end of the design business, and maybe even some politics to be able to implement the systems that we generate. Um, the corporations on the other hand also need to tweak their current thinking. This is the Stanford model for product development which is used in most corporations, which has to do with the intersection between viable, desirable, and feasible. And my proposal is that we need to add the three E's to that. We need to add ecology, e-economy, e-economy, and ethics to it. And ethics will start to address what is what the business really wants to be able to um, offer the market, but in an ethical sense, taking the human values into consideration. And when we are developing products, we need to keep ecocentric considerations in mind. And of course, the e-economy, which has become a big part of the new marketplace, which includes uh, crowdsourcing, shared economy, and uh, even cryptocurrency. You know, thinking about what, how this will affect the whole product development process and the implementation process and how we can develop the pipelines to make our designs be implementable in the marketplace. The good news is that we are very good at, as designers, we are very good at cutting cubes out of the fog, seeing the patterns, connecting the dots, and progressively building clarity. These are strengths we have, and these are strengths which the society can use, leverage, you know, if we can bring it to the fore. But the biggest challenge we have in countries like India is the chaos. You know, managing the chaos is going to be the noise in the system which we cannot seem to control or have. But the question is, can we deal with it? And I'm going to leave you with this thought that do we need automated cars here or will bumper cars do? You know? So essentially thinking about the working with the chaos and not against it to make things happen. Thank you very much. And thank you to WDO for making me a member.